good to see everybody this evening. Uh, welcome our visitors. We are continuing our gospel meeting effort. Uh, if you're here, you probably know this fellow that's preaching for us. He's no stranger to the area. If you're familiar with Great Harden University, you're familiar with him. And he's done great work in the kingdom throughout the years, and I appreciate him so much. I've actually had to have I uh, had an opportunity to have a couple of classes with him at Bear Valley and got to know him better that way. And I really appreciate him. And I want to say something about the commentaries. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer there on the table for his commentaries on the book of John. And that was one of the classes that I had with Brother Life there at Bear Valley. And those commentaries are outstanding. It's two volume set. They're $30 a piece. And he said, or you can pay $37 if you want to order them through uh, resource publications. I believe yesterday I said publishing. At the different uh, company there, but it's a great commentary. Be an asset to your library. I know you would appreciate that. If you want a copy of those commentaries? You can go ahead and, and leave a check with him. I'll give you a receipt for that. See me after services. I'll make sure I'm taking care of that for him, so he can he can do his part preaching the gospel here and meeting and greeting all of our visitors. We'll continue this gospel meeting through Wednesday night, each night at seven o'clock. We'd love to have you with us. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to sing a few songs. A couple songs have the word of prayer. At the appropriate time, if uh, um, Mike Rattler, if you would please lead us in a word of prayer, the opening prayer, and at the closing of the prayer of Mike Children, if you please lead us in a word of prayer for that. We'll sing, first of all, Lord, we come before thee now. Lord, we come before thee now.
blessing we receive from it. Our hearts are heavy now to those who are sick, especially uh, Brother Barber and uh, Sister Jill Rice. We ask that you be with them with their own hospice. We ask they also to be with Jean Mouse. She has her surgery this week. As they also lift others among us sick. We also ask those who uh, suffer from COVID. As they be with us as we struggle through this. Be with the eldership they make these decisions. Be with them. Also, uh, be with uh, Barry and his family as they work here with us. Also, as they be with Brother Hype as he brings this message to us this week. Uh, so, thank you. He came away. We ask thee, thank thee for thy son who sent to die on the cross. We ask thee to go with us through the remaining part of the service. Forgive us of our sins. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. speaks to us, we'll sing the gospel is for all. <clears throat> sing all three verses. Would please let's stand at this time. <clears throat> singing. You guys are blessed. We have Brother McKay did an incredible job yesterday. And uh, thank you, Brother Mike, for leading us in that prayer. Very thought-provoking. And um, grateful for your hospitality that we've had. We were a bit rushed. I hope you didn't think that we purposefully came just a little bit later than usual, but 
and some life circumstances that uh, prohibited us from uh, being able to be here when we wanted to. And uh, I want to say thanks to some dear friends of mine. First of all, Dana and Mark Blackwell, where you are. There you are. <clears throat> Mark and I were talking about this. You cannot understand if you've never spoken before an audience what it feels like to have to talk to mass. It's, uh, let me just say it's terrible, okay? And <clears throat> if you didn't have those masks on, I'd get excited a little bit. But uh, at any rate, I, uh, I love to see the expressions on people's faces, you know, when the word's being declared. But it's good to see Mark and Dana, two of the finest folks on, on this earth. We've been to Israel with them. Mark and I worked together on the lectureship committee for many years. Had Mark as a student, and he's a, a great example of, of, a, of a man who transcends his professors. And Mark, it's great to have you and Dana here tonight. And then join me in with Alex, and just met his lovely wife, Cassie, yesterday. And it's good to be with her also. And I want to say thanks to some from Ashland, Mississippi. Donald and Lynn over here, and then, sorry, I forgot your names. But, That's all right, preacher. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Appreciate it. And uh, all the way from Ashland, Donald preaches for the Ashland uh, Church of Christ there and has been doing a great job along with his uh, good wife, Lynn. And she can make a biscuit if you ever get that opportunity. And uh, among other things. And then Don and Norma Hobson from the Beach Hill Congregation. They've driven quite a ways also. We've been friends for many years. It's good to see them too. And there are probably some others perhaps I'm overlooking. But anybody else drive from over in Tupper County, Benton County, or somewhere like that, I'm missing. Well, it's good to see you guys. Thank you for making that uh, trip. All right, now, <clears throat> if I can get my breath here, I was sort of rushing, rushing in, but I'm about to get settled down a little bit, Alex. Have you got your Bibles? Can I see them, please? Hold them up, good, good. All right, all right, all right. I need you to have your Bibles. I wanna talk with you a little bit tonight about the gospel of Christ. Our text is, of course, going to be Romans 1, 14 through 17. I can't think of a more classic passage of Scripture than these verses of Scripture. The Apostle Paul said, I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The Apostle Paul feels under obligation to share the gospel, the good news of God's saving grace. That's what the word gospel is about. That's what its message is about, God's saving grace. And Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel, and he tells us why. <clears throat> he says that it is the power of God unto salvation. <clears throat> That's the reason he's not ashamed of it. And he goes further to expand <clears throat> this idea by saying, in the gospel is revealed the righteousness of God. Now, very sometimes <clears throat> we speak of the righteousness of God like an attribute of God. You know, like uh, the love of God, the holiness of God, etc. <clears throat> and that's certainly, you know, the way the Bible uses the word righteousness. And that would be describing um, righteousness as an attribute. But sometimes I think that it's used in another way. And I think it's uh, emphasized in this passage this other way. Namely, a divine activity. And so what is Paul saying? <clears throat> he is saying in the gospel of Christ is revealed the means <clears throat> by which we are made righteous. Now God is a righteous God, but the point Paul's making in Romans 1, 17 is that by the gospel we're made righteous. I like to say it this way. We're righteous by the gospel. <clears throat> you see, without having obeyed the gospel, we are lost. We are undone. We are separated from God. And that separation, if we are not reconciled to God, will cause us to lose our souls. That's just the, the long and short of it. It's that simple. 
And so when we obey the gospel of Christ, we're able to be reconciled. We're able to have a right relationship with God. And so I want to talk with you a little bit this evening about the gospel of Christ. Now notice, I've emphasized the, and I've done that purposefully because I don't want to talk to you tonight about a gospel. But you can turn your television on, you can turn your radio on, and you can hear things on purported to be uh, the gospel, but they're not the gospel. You don't have to listen very long until you can conclude, well, that's not what the good book says. Every one of us have had that experience. And so tonight, let's talk about the gospel of Christ. I have four or five points. I'll make a couple of them, and you'll be happy because it would take a lot longer <laughs> to go farther than that. But we'll see how we do. <clears throat> the first point that I want to make about the gospel of Christ is the gospel is something that God wants us to preach. Now, as soon as I say that, <clears throat> I don't want those of you who are not preachers to just tune out and say, well, now, Brother David's not talking about me. When I say the gospel is something that God wants us to preach, I'm using the word preach in a very broad way. The gospel is something that God wants us to teach. It is something that God wants us to share with other people. And guess what? That means every one of us can do that. Isn't that right? Men can do it. Women can do it. Boys can do it. Girls can do it. All of us, in some way or the other, are authorized by Scripture to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who have, are lost and undone. So the gospel is something God wants us to preach. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 16, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Necessity is laid upon me, he says. And so I wish that every one of us tonight who have named the name of Christ would leave you know, feeling the, the compulsion to share the message of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Are you listening? That is the only hope that this world has. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's what we all, you know, are, are looking forward to. Uh, our, our response to the gospel is, is that which enables us to be reconciled to God and enables us eventually to have eternal life. And so at the end of the day, that's the only thing that matters. Is that right or wrong? That's the only thing that matters. The gospel is something God wants us to teach, to preach, to tell other people about it. And we must take that responsibility seriously. Now, I want to use an illustration that's old as the hills. And uh, those of you who preached, I know, uh, have used this illustration. If you haven't used it, you've heard it. So it's nothing new, but indulge me, okay? That's what you do to old people, so you indulge them, all right? Um, maybe not? <laughs> okay. I, I already talked to y'all yesterday. Didn't I talk to y'all yesterday about Acts chapter 1? Y'all gazing into the heavens, that's what some of you remember. So, so, so get with it here now, okay? I can't see all of you, but I can see your eyes. I know what you're thinking. Okay, there you go. All right, I like it. <clears throat> All right, here you go. Let's say in our area right now, there are three really good congregations looking for um, a gospel preacher. And so you've had that experience before, I'm sure, uh, in this area. All right? Even here. All right. That's a, let's say that here's a, a given congregation. Uh, they are looking for a minister. And sometimes... Uh, the way that word has gotten out is in uh, preachers' meetings. It's on Facebook. Uh, it's at, uh, you know, gospel advocate. Do they still have that little thing in the back, you know, where it shows, you know, the need for a preacher or, or whatever? And so <clears throat> the word gets out. So here's a preacher that hears that a given congregation is looking for a minister. And so he writes the eldership a letter. And he says, Dear brethren, I understand that y'all are looking for a preacher, and I'm a preacher, and I want to apply for the work. But I'm a very candid person, and there's some things that I just want you to know about me up front. First of all, I want you all to know that I'm an old man. 
I have been called the aged one. Number two, I want you all to know that I'm not married, I never have been married, and I don't have any plans on getting married. Number three, I want you uh, to know <clears throat> that the churches with which I have worked in the past have had problems. And number four, I'd like for you to know that I was recently released from jail. I'm very interested in meeting with you and discussing the possibility of working you know, with you all. Sincerely yours. Now can you imagine how the average eldership would look at that? I don't know how you do it here, but typically in eldership, you'll have someone who's the chairman of the month or the chairman of the quarter or something like that. And so, so the chairman of the month or whomever is reading the letter, and then he, he just puts it down, he looks at his fellow elders and he says, can you imagine this knucklehead <laughs> writing us and having the audacity to say these things? Well, notice what he says. In the first place, he says he's an old man. We can't use an old man here. We got to have a young Younger person, we need somebody about 35 or so. I mean, after all, who's going to take our young people on canoe trips? And who's going to take them to the bowling alley and the skating rink or whatever they, you know, they plan on doing? Out of church, Alex uh, called me, want me to help him find a preacher. I get a call nearly every week. And I say, well, what kind of preacher do you want? I mean, to me, Mark, that's a legitimate question. And they'll say, well, we want somebody who's a graduate of a school. Sometimes they'll say a preacher training school, Barry. Sometimes they'll say they want somebody with a bachelor's degree or, or, or whatever. They want somebody with a certain amount of experience and so forth. And they typically say they want a married man and, and all of that. And then uh, they'll say, we really don't want anybody older than 35. And I love to do this. And I'll say, well... And, and it'll be friends that call me frequently. And so I'll say, well, I guess that means that y'all wouldn't let me send my application. Oh, no, Brother Luck, we're not talking about you. And I'll say, don't be crawfishing on me now. I said, I'm more than twice 35. And I said, now just stick to your guns. I just, you know, wanted to, you know, let you know that you mean that I am left out of the application process. I just feel like, you know, I've preached 52 years. I just won't tell them that. All right, and then, at any rate, then they'll say, uh, well, we, don't, we want somebody married, okay? And uh, that, the elder would say, can you imagine, uh, you know, us having a preacher who's not married? I mean, after all, it's been tradition in churches of Christ forever, you know, to have two people with one, for one salary. I mean, after all, who's going to, you know, uh, deal with the women's committee and uh, uh, all the things that are going on with the ladies? And then furthermore, he says that the churches that he's been with have had problems. Lord knows we have enough problems as it is. And then what's the community going to think when we got a jailbird in the pulpit? And so they throw that application away. But you know of whom I speak, right? Wasn't it the Apostle Paul who was not married? Wasn't it the Apostle Paul who was the aged one? Wasn't it the Apostle Paul who had problems with churches with uh, whom he worked? Was it not the Apostle Paul who was imprisoned, you know, for his stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his preaching of the gospel? Yes. It just bothers me a little bit when we outline these particular parameters that would exclude someone like the Apostle Paul from working with a congregation. What in the round world's that about? There's got to be something wrong with that, isn't it? At least it appears so to me. You can Besides our Lord Jesus Christ, brethren, listen to me, are you listening? Besides our Lord Jesus Christ, can you think of anybody more dedicated to the proclamation of the gospel? You cannot think of anybody. I mean, here's a man who sacrificed for the gospel. Listen to him in um, 2 Corinthians 11, beginning about verse 23. And now what he's having to do in 2 Corinthians 11 is defend his apostleship. And so he begins by raising a question. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labor is more abundant and stripes above measure and prisons more frequent. And deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice have I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In 
journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, and fastings often. And besides those things that are without, that which comes upon me every day, the anxiety of all the churches. Did you hear that? Did you hear what Paul said? I mean, we're talking about a man who was floating on a board out in the ocean due to being shipwrecked because he's trying to go to another place to preach the gospel. And I know tonight that I'm talking to some committed people. I know tonight that you could have been somewhere else. This is Monday night, and you didn't have to be here, but you have chosen to be here and I know that I'm talking to some committed folks tonight. But I want you to take these words, if you will, and <clears throat> let them sink deep into your own life. And perhaps it can help you in communicating with those who are not as committed. Brethren, do you think we really know what commitment is today? I wonder, do we really understand commitment? I was <clears throat> leading a campaign over in another state. And I'm sure y'all have done, Barry, you put campaigns together and <clears throat> you're a hard worker and, and I, I know you've done that. And others, Mark has put countless ones, uh, you know, of activities together, you know, him and Dana. And Donald, you, you've had a lot of work in Mexico and so forth. And at any rate, you know how much work it is to put a campaign together. I like to have about 12, no more than 15 you know, people on the campaign. And, and it's really hard to get people to commit a couple of weeks of their life you know, to some effort. They know they're not going to receive any kind of you know, remuneration or whatever, but we need your life for two weeks. And we're going to go into a particular place you know, that might be you know, difficult. So I was leading this campaign I put together. I mean, I made arrangements for the transportation. I got the finances requisite, you know, for uh, the gasoline, for uh, the food, you know, to, for everything that is, is necessary, you know, to take care of 12 or 14 people, all right? So we finally get to this place. Now here's an idea. If you build a building you know, to worship in, get a sign. What do you think? Wouldn't that be helpful? Get a sign. Well, I finally found this place. And it was a small place. It wouldn't accommodate more than maybe 100 people at the most. I mean, you'd have to crowd them in. It was in a mission area. So, <clears throat> finally get there. You know, I'm, I'm looking around. And there's a, there's a few things a preacher wants to know. When I show up to a place like this, I want to know, number one, where's the water fountain? Number two, where's the restroom? Number three, and most important, where's the baptistry? Have you got a baptistry? And then I've learned, because of my experience, to ask, has it got any water in it? Okay. That's important too, right? I was in a place, this was over in Georgia, and on another uh, trip, and I couldn't find the third thing, couldn't find the baptistry. And, and, and I said, y'all have a baptistry? They said, yes. And they, they took me out in the, in the foyer, Mark. I thought, well, it's kind of strange. You know, most times, baptistry's up here, right? And they, so they started walking to the front of the building. And I'm like, you know, what's the deal? And they said, this is it. And I looked down, and it was, it was like a little lily pond or something. You know, in the fort. I mean, it had lily pads and stuff in it. And I said, that's the baptistry. I said, has it got any fish in it? You know? <laughs> oh, we didn't have any fish in it. And I thought, well, I mean, that'll work, right? Uh, the Lord just said, have water, right? And I told you yesterday, we've got to have some walls around it, correct? <laughs> and so, well, at any rate, I'm at this place. And I, I told him, I said, uh, uh, where's your baptistry? And the, and the preacher said, well, we didn't put one in. 
And I said, okay, now let me be sure. I am at such and such a place, right? This is so-and-so Church of Christ, right? And I said, you don't have a bachelor. You built a building. You spent several thousand dollars to build this building, but you didn't get a tank of any kind. No, things are kind of slow here. I learned later that there was a lot of truth in that. <coughs> At any rate, I'm preaching the gospel Sunday morning, trying to get people fired up. I mean, we're going to work every day, knock doors and do everything that's involved in the campaign and so forth. And I'm <coughs> just doing all I could, you know, trying to encourage people, you know, to get ready to work, you know, for the week. And the preacher came up to me after service. I never will forget it. It's right up in this area in front of that pew right there, Brother Mike, in front of you. And, and he walked up to me. He's doing this number. He's wringing his hands. I've learned this over time, too. If somebody starts doing that, there's usually a little problem or something. Else. Anyway, he says, Brother Ike, we got a problem. And I said, really? And I'm thinking, okay, as much as I talk, I'm bound to have said something that's offended somebody. You know, I said something about a sacred cow in this area. And, and I said, well, what is it, brother? I said, spit it out. He said, well, it's a big problem. I said, well, tell me what it is. Whatever I've said or done, I'll repent of it. And, you know, we'll, we'll move forward. we got work to do. He said, well, I'll just tell you. Oh, fine, great, I'd love to hear it. He said, well, your sermon was 45 minutes long. I was kind of relieved. You know? <laughs> and, and I said, I said, so, um, what's the issue? I mean, we've come up here to help y'all, you know, to get this thing going here and, and uh, try to get the word out in the community. I said, what's the issue? He said, well, our tapes are only 30 minutes. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. This, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you know what I said to him? I said, buy longer tapes. <laughs> I just could not get over it. You know, here, here I am doing the best I can, you know, working my liver out, trying to get people cranked up to spread the good news of God's saving grace, and we're worried about the length of the stinking tapes. What is that about? I mean, there's got to be something wrong with that kind of thinking. I mean, nobody gets, get all, gets all bent out of shape, you know, at a ball game, do they? I mean, maybe they do. I don't know. I don't do that. Uh, I've been to, I went to something, yeah, I went to something that my granddaughter was in. She is, uh, what do you call it at halftime? Uh, she had a flag. She twirled her flag around. Flag dog. Yeah, okay, whatever that is. Anyway, I asked my daughter, I said, when does that start? And she told me. I said, well, I'll be there. I didn't go to the ball game. I went for, you know, her. I sat on a bleacher to break your back. And, there, and I did it for about 30 minutes. Did you know there are people that will go to things like that and they'll sit there for hours. And they'll do it in the rain, the sleet, and the snow. And God have mercy on the preacher if he preaches 45 minutes. I'm telling you, there's something wrong with that. Now, you can just think what you want to and you may disagree with, with me. And you have the right to be wrong on that score. But, brethren... We need to learn that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope of this world. And we need to rejoice in the opportunity to share that news. And we need to rejoice in efforts, you know, to share it. The early church gave their lives for the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to be willing to do that, you know, today. Number two. The gospel, and I'll just, I'm going to just have two points, so I'll just, you can relax, okay? <laughs> Number two, the gospel is God's power to save. It is God's power to save. The English word power here is translated from the Greek word dunamis, from which we get such words as dynamic, dynamo, dynamite. Now, I, I, like, I like the dynamite word myself. The gospel is God's dynamite unto salvation. It's God's explosive power, if you will. Now, Barry, I think it's a guy thing.
things. But we guys like stuff that'll blow up. Don't we? We like it. Mark, I think, I want to say maybe Kippy was with us, I can't remember, but we were going up to uh, Dixie Castle in Jackson. And you know how you turn off of 45 there and go around by the convention center and so forth? On the left-hand side was a parking lot. And there was, a, it was a Ford truck. And I was so happy it was a Ford truck. But anyway, <laughs> instead of a good Chevrolet, okay. <laughs> I know I'll hear something from you on that, in spite of the fact that I've got three Fords, but they all have Chevy motors in them. Okay, <laughs> all right, now. At any rate, this was a Ford truck, and smoke was coming out of the wheel, you know, the front wheel wells. And I pulled over to the side of the road, and I told Linda, I said, call 911. And uh, so she did. She said, let's go. I said, not on your life. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to wait right here. That thing might blow up. <laughs> and it was amazing. I mean, it, it took the fire people about 10 minutes to get there, and it was just engulfed in flames, but I never did get to see the explosion. But we guys like that kind of thing. I think, I think it's a guy thing. At least it appears that way to me. But now when the Apostle Paul said the gospel is God's power, he was not thinking about that kind of image, all right? There are other images of power. What about love? Is there power in love? What is it that enables a parent to stay up night after night with a sick child? Is that not love? What is it that enables a child to stay up night after night, you know, with aging parents? and addressing uh, their needs. Is that not love? You see, there's great power in love. Well, let me tell you something. The gospel is God's power to save because it's a love story. It's a love story. Turn to Romans chapter 5, if you would. Romans 5. I want you to hear what, the brother, uh, what Brother Paul said and how he said it. Now, verse 4, or no, I'm sorry, 5. Now, hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. <clears throat> Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, Yet for adventure for a good man, some would dare to die. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we should be saved by wrath, from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, I want you to look at these verses. You can remember this. I want you to remember it. I'm going to give you a test on it, okay? I know how to mark tell you. I know how to give a test on it. Okay, no, no, I'm just kidding there. But listen to me. Easy to remember. Three even verses, 6, 8, and 10. You got it? Where are we? What book are we in? Talk to me. Romans, what chapter? Five. Okay, you got it. 6, 8, and 10. Ready? Verse 6. When we were without strength and ungodly, Christ died for us. Verse 8, when we were what? Sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, what? When we were enemies, Christ died for us. Listen to me. God did, did not look down on humanity and say, I want you to look how wonderful those people are. Look how kind they are toward one another. Look how tenderhearted they are. Look how forgiving they are. I think I'll send my son to die for those really sweet people. No! That is not what he saw. What he saw was, look at those people who are ungodly, verse 6. Look at those people who are sinners, verse 8. Look at those people who are my enemies. They have hostility in their mind for me. I'm going to send my son to die for those people. I want those people. Now you think about that. God wants the ungodly. God wants sinners. He wants his enemies to be in fellowship with him. 
I mean, God coming to this world is a demonstration of the fact that he wanted to enter into a relationship with people. Can you comprehend that? Can you really comprehend that? You know, that God wants me. He doesn't want us to stay in a sinful state, but he wants sinners. You know, I think, I'm just speculating here, Mark, but I, I can't help but wonder if the Orthodox Jew could ever really comprehend that. I've just wondered about that, Barry. Could they ever really comprehend, you know, how self-righteous they were and so forth. I wonder, could they have ever really understood God wants sinners? But if I, don't, if I understand what this book says, I think that's what it says. That's the reason the gospel is a love story. That's love. You want to know how much God loves you? All you have to do is look at the cross. And you'll see the manifestation of the love of God. That's all you have to do is look at the cross. And you'll see the manifestation of God's love. But now here's the, th here's the thing about it. <clears throat> I told you what the gospel is. I told you the gospel has the power to save, right? Everybody knows that. I've told you that the gospel is for sinners, for ungodly, for enemies. I've told you that. But in order for us to be benefited by the atoning um, benefits of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have to respond to that gospel. Reminds me, when I was, when I was a young and lived at my, my uh, grandmother's house for several years, and <clears throat> I thought it was the neatest place. I mean, the chicken yard and the yard was the same yard. Y'all ever had, had that experience? Some of you have, I know you have. And, <clears throat> you know, her, her back of her house was real high off the ground and the chickens get under there and then make all these nests and, and, and she is bad to dip snuff and boy those snuff bottles they were you know tractors and trucks and, and all of that as I played played over there. And one day she heard me bragging about our two hole right back. And she said that wasn't anything to brag about. She said we're the only ones in the whole community that hadn't got running water. Don't be talking about that. I didn't know any better. I thought it was pretty neat myself. But anyway. She had in the corner of her kitchen a cistern. And I thought that was pretty neat too because I knew my where my cousin lived, they had a well out in the backyard where you went out and you pumped water, you know, in, in the backyard. And I, I was bragging about that. We had got to pump water out of the ground. We got a cistern in the, cistern in the kitchen. And what she'd do, Mark, she, after a big rain, she'd raise the window She'd let it rain a while and then raise the window and then take the gutter and, and, and bring it inside and let it run into the cistern. That's how she gathered her water. And I remember one day being up on the edge of that cistern and her, you know, telling me, get off of that ledge, boy. You're going to fall over in there. And if you fall over in there, I'll have to drop the bucket down to you. And that'll be the way I could get out. You hold on to that, and I'll pull you out. Fortunately, I never fell. But as I grew older, and as we do, we think back over our childhood and have various memories like this, but I got to thinking that would make a good illustration at least of my understanding of God, His grace, and my response. You see, if I fell in that well, would I be in a, in a bad way? I would, wouldn't I? Would there be any hope for me, a little boy, five years old? Probably not, right? But all of a sudden, from above comes what? A grandmother who loved me and lowered a bucket down, you know, telling me to take hold of it. And to me, that illustrates God in heaven in his love for mankind and his grace and his mercy and his willingness to make known his grace and his mercy to all of mankind and then he wants us to respond to that. We respond with a biblical faith. We respond in love. We respond in obedience to him. We respond with a biblical faith, which says, God, 
you know, we love you and we're willing to do whatever this good book tells us to do. You know, what if we don't understand it? Well, that's okay. I'm willing to submit to it. Like old brother Abraham, he didn't understand everything, did he? God told him what? Leave your land. <laughs> See, now me, I would have said, where are we going? How long is it going to take us to get there? You got a GPS? <laughs> Not Abraham. The Bible says he got up and left. And what about when he was offered, the, uh, challenged to offer his son in Genesis 22? What, what did he ask? Nothing. He got up early to go do it. And that's what God wants out of us, folks. He wants us to respond to his grace. He wants us to take hold of the rope, you know, that he has lowered down, you know, for us. And so what I'm saying is, I can tell you the story, but you got to believe it. You got to believe it with a biblical faith. That means to take God at his word, to humbly submit to whatever the book says. Now, there are some things you don't have to believe, and that's okay. But if you're going to be saved, you've got to believe and obey the gospel. Is that right? Amen? Amen. It's weak, but I'll take it. <laughs> you've got to believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Suppose today you say, well, Brother Life, I've decided that... Uh, I've decided I don't think two plus two is going to equal four anymore in my life. What do you think about that? Fine, I don't care. Go for it. I think you're going to have problems balancing your checkbook. You probably have some trouble with the math on your um, income tax. But if that makes you happy, go for it. It doesn't matter to me. But you got to believe the gospel. See, that matters to me. I was doing uh, some lectures on Christian evidences. It was over in Florence, Alabama area. Actually, I think it was in Tuscumbia or Muscle Shoals. I forget the name of the congregation now. But anyway, I had been talking this particular night. I'll tell you this real quick. We'll close. I was talking this particular night on the argument based on design, the order and adjustment in the human body and our world. And then I was saying that design implies intelligence, and you know, you know where I'm going with that. You know, therefore, God exists, okay? And so I was saying such things as, just think about our, our Earth, tilted on its axis 23.5 degrees, makes a revolution every 24 hours, uh, goes around the sun every 365 and one fourth days, in its rotation departs a straight line by one ninth of an inch ever 18 miles, not by one eighth or, and not by one tenth. And all of these intricate details, you know, Earth having a moon 240,000 miles away that does its thing about every 30 days and, and so forth and so on. And I said, you know, therefore, you know, this, this incredible order and adjustment implies design and this design implies a designer. And after service, I was putting my papers together, and this old gentleman came up to me. He has been over with years, and he is, you know, marking just in his britches. Watch, watch this, and watch this. Okay. And he said, "Brother Life," I said, "Yes, sir." I'd already heard about this man. He's like, he like laid the cornerstone. You know, I mean, he was really important in the work of the church there. He said, Brother Life, they tried to convince me when I was a boy that the earth revolved around the sun. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. And he said, I'll tell you something else. While we're on this subject, I don't think me and ever went to the moon. Serious as he can be. Have you heard that E.F. Hutton commercial? You know, where you could hear a pin drop? That's what it, everybody, it was after service, everybody talking, and all of a sudden when they heard him speak, it was like silence. They're looking at me, I could just sense it. And after a few seconds, it seemed like an eternity for me, but after a few seconds, I, I said, brother, I've heard of the contribution that you've made to the Lord's church here. And I said, I want you to know how grateful I am to you for your years of service. I commend you for it. Applaud your efforts, and I want you to continue to do what you can in your senior years. 
We had some more small talk, and he went on his way. And then I had people coming up to me and said, Brother Lyle, we thought you had one of those doctor's degrees. I said, well, I do, University of Tennessee. And, well, why didn't you set him straight? And I thought, again, for a few seconds. And I said, well, two things. I said, in the first place, he has said that he has not been convinced of these facts ever since he was a boy. He's now above 80 years of age. Who am I to think that I've got the power to change his mind? And I said, but most important, number two, what difference does it make? I mean, really. I mean, I don't care if he thinks the earth is flat, if you, you know, go out on the ocean so, so uh, far and eventually fall off the side, fine. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter to me because I don't think that's going to interfere with your salvation. But let me tell you tonight, what interferes with your salvation is this, not obeying the gospel. Now that interferes. You must believe the gospel and you must obey it. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God and if it first began at us, what shall the end be of those who obey not the gospel? Paul told us in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, Do you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from the heavens with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. That's the end of folks who don't obey the gospel. I'm your friend when I tell you that. Don't be angry with the messenger. I'm telling you what the book says. I, I feel compelled, you know, to tell you this. Because there's nothing more important in this world than obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your salvation depends upon it. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. When you obey the gospel, you have, a, you have a great life now. Not a life free completely of trouble, but you're part of the family, family of God, where you can love one another and eventually hug one another again and shake a hand, right? Right? I hope I'm right about that. Hope you don't keep this indefinitely. <laughs> you don't want to, I know. But it's a great family, isn't it? I don't know how people in the world make it without being part of God's family. I really don't. And then one of these days to hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the kingdom prepared for you. Won't that be great? Amen? Amen. I love every person here tonight. And... I know you have love for me. We love each other. And if you've not named the name of Christ, I beg with you tonight to do it before it's everlasting too late. Do that tonight. And if you have and you're committed to the Lord, praise God. I'm happy for that. And I want you to continue to stay the course. And then if you have named the name of Christ, but you've you know, not been the person you need to be, you know, the Bible teaches us to confess our faults to each other and to pray for one another. And I know already that there are good and faithful brothers here who will pray with you and pray for you. Won't you let us help you tonight as we stand and as we sing? When we walk with the Lord
appreciate so much your attendance here tonight. I hope and trust you can come and be with us again tomorrow night. You know we're going to hear an outstanding lesson again. The life's doing a great job, and we're thankful to have him here with us this week. If you're visiting, we're honored to have you here. I hope and trust you've made, been made to feel welcome as much as possible as he's noted in these difficult times. But it is good to see you and hope you can be back with us. If you have any questions for us, let us know what we can do to help. Again, if you're interested in the set of commentaries, let me know. I'll be in the back uh, immediately after we are dismissed and try to help you with those uh, concerns you may have there. We're going to sing the first and third verse of Tarry With Me, and then we'll be led in our closing prayer. Tarry with me, O oh my Savior, for the day. Son's name. Amen.